Almost two and a half years after a night on the water turned deadly in South Carolina, police release recordings that should answer all the questions. Instead, they raise more, such as why did it take so long to suspect a Murdoch? Tonight, you'll hear those police recordings yourself. And the Governor Cuomo's saga, on one hand, he was a media darling last year. Others say some members of the press dropped the ball or maybe even carried it for him at times. That debate tonight on Banfield. Hello and welcome to Banfield. I'm Adrian Bankard. Back in June, when Maggie and Paul Murdoch, mother and son, were murdered on their own property in South Carolina, the world got to know what their low country neighbors had known for decades. The Murdochs are rich, powerful, and extremely well connected. We also learned of a then 20 year old Paul Murdoch's involvement in a 2019 boat crash that killed a young woman named Mallory Beach. At the time of his own death, Paul was awaiting trial for boating under the influence, but from the beginning, questions arose about the power of his famous name to cushion whatever legal blows he might face. Tonight, almost two and a half years after that crash, we have real-time audio of police interviews with another young man on that boat on that night, and they raise even more questions. Joining us now to break all of this down are civil rights and criminal defense attorney Mark O'Mara, investigative reporter Andrew Davis from WSAV-TV in Savannah, and from TV's hot bench, former New York State trial judge Patricia Domango. Thank you guys so much for being here. Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Fill in some of those details of the backstory that we're just talking about right now. Tell us why these newly released recordings are so important. Well, they really give you a real sense of exactly what happened before, during, and after the crash that ended up killing Mallory Beach, who was just 19 years old at the time. We've already known that Paul Murdaugh, who was only 20 at the time, went to the Parker's Convenience Store, a local convenience store chain here, went to buy alcohol for himself and his friends. He bought several six packs of, of White Claw as well as various beers came out of the store almost triumphantly after using his own brother's ID, a fake ID at that point for him to go ahead and purchase that alcohol. From then he met up with his friends from what we've understood at the Murdoch Island property that belonged to his grandfather, Randolph Murdoch. Randolph Murdoch, a longtime solicitor in the area for five counties, dealing with all the criminal cases in this entire region and was very, very powerful by all accounts. The property that they ended up going to, that Murdoch property known as the island over on Chichesse Creek. From there, they moved there and apparently were drinking there. They went to an oyster roast on Pawkey's Island as well and proceeded to continue to drink there. After that, most of the passengers from what the depositions have said have gone ahead and said that they were ready to go to be done. But Paul wanted to continue on and wanted shots at a local restaurant in Buford called Luther's Rare and Well Done. So Paul drove the boat under the influence at the time, is what we're understanding, to get more alcohol. In the meantime, his own people, you can see there at the bar, he went ahead and got shots. There were others through the surveillance video that she saw over that you can see over on the docks. You see Mallory Beach, her boyfriend Anthony Cook, several of the other passengers, six in all on that boat, who were walking in the area. Paul proceeded to continue drinking. You see them there getting on then from the boat. Then everything that we're hearing said there were multiple people involved on that boat that wanted someone else to drive other than Paul, but Paul refused and Paul proceeded to drive, that's when it turned deadly. He was going at an apparent high rate of speed through Archer's Creek, a small area there, did not have control, was in arguments involved with people, so his attention may very well have been taken to the side, and he hit a piling that was there. Hit a piling, flew out, Mallory Beach flew out into the water. Several of the other passengers were injured badly in that crash. Beach fell into the water, and she, was gone, not to be found for seven more days. The 19 year old was finally found almost a mile away after a long, lengthy search. Paul Murdoch was charged, as you said, with boating under the influence, but Mallory Beach was never to be seen again, alive, died. Now her, civil, her parents have filed a civil suit, but Paul Murdoch, the background to this is he never even spent a day in jail, didn't spend a moment in jail, took a quote unquote mugshot inside the courtroom itself part of the power that this family had in this area and that allegedly they were using to try to keep their son and grandson out of jail.
It's just, it's so much like a movie. It's fascinating and eerie even to watch those videos of the group of young people just walking around late at night and you know the ending. At least we know some of what happened. Let's listen to a portion of that newly released recording now. What about the driver of the boat, C-21? No. Is everybody on the boat been drinking? Yeah. Especially the driver? How big to drive that driver how much has he had to drink tonight? dude I, I can tell you this much we left i don't even know where we were mm -hmm. we left and stopped downtown buford and i me and him about fought on the dock because i told him not to go up there that hard that we needed to be going home downtown and how are y'all drinking down there and none of hell i wasn't i stayed on the damn boat but he went he was drinking actually at the bar i reckon I didn't go up there. So y'all came from downtown through the creek, and that's Ooh. when it was going way too fast? So I don't even know. I finally got to the point I grabbed my girlfriend and put her in my lap in the bottom of the boat and was holding on with my eyes closed. The next thing I know, I'm in the water and I can't find it. And you're listening to the voice of Anthony Cook, one of Paul Murdoch's friends, at least. That's what they called each other. Uh, Mark, I'd like to bring you in. Again, this case sounds just like a movie plot. A 19-year-old woman killed. We talked about that. Mallory Beach. Now, we're only eight weeks since the death of Paul Murdoch. And from the sound of the audio, the person who could stand to be at least a person of interest is Mallory's boyfriend, Anthony Cook. Paul's father, Alex, was the one who actually found Paul and his mother's bodies on the family property. Reports were that he had a strong alibi. But one thing that does seem clear, undoubtedly, this had to be somebody the Murdoch's knew, right? It certainly seems so. They knew um, where to go. They knew they were able to access the property. And, and again, the way it happened, this was not random. This was not some robbery. This was somebody who seemed to plan to kill both, uh, different weapons, which is sort of strange in and of itself, but plan to kill both and accomplish it, and also did it in a way where they've gotten away because there is still no real suspect on those first, most recent two murders. And really, we, we have not heard from law enforcement about any people of interest. Again, this is all just possible, uh, potential motive. We're looking at who could possibly have done this. And it's complicated because we're giving you footage now from the family's hunting lodge where both Paul Murdoch and his mother were found. And then we have this case involving the boating accident where it seems to have started this domino effect of death in this community. Judge Domingo, about a month after Paul and his mother's death, Connor Cook, Anthony's cousin, he had attorneys file paperwork alleging that police and sheriff's deputies who arrived on scene actually conspired to shift the blame away from Paul and possibly frame Connor as the operator of the boat. How would this complicate a case like this? Well, anytime there are allegations that there's some sort of internal police um, Things, things going on with the police department. Yeah. You're going to be concerned that the information that you're getting is not accurate, it's not reliable, it hasn't been uh, investigated properly, and throughout the course of this case, these things keep arising. And so there's always this talk about, uh, has the family's uh, well-known reputation and power, has it caused um, an interference with the uh, governmental administration? Uh, are the police um, either on their own or at the request of this family? Are they getting involved in this in a way that has tainted the evidence? What took so long for uh, there to be an arrest in this case? What happened to this evidence? Why are things coming out so so long after uh, the situation? I mean, this information, this tape, is two more than two years after the actual boat accident. So there's a, there's a lot of suspicion and, and a lot of talk that goes around. And right now, there are a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of finger pointing. And I think this really needs to be to be sorted out in, in, a, in, a, in a very clean way. And sometimes these things, um, really, you, you need to bring them to an objective person and not just the police department. Mark, before filing a lawsuit, which they possibly might do, the petition filed uh, by Cook ask that those officers be deposed, what could this mean for ensuring a fair trial? 
Well, we know what they're going to do is they're going to be very methodical in trying to look at this case right now and see what they're going to do with it. And we know from the evidence that has come out and very little so far that it seems as though the officers, as, as the judge just mentioned, they lose some very significant evidence which would have led towards possibly Paul Murdaugh's conviction had he survived. Uh, there's other questions where they seem to be moving or trying to move the blame away from the Murdoch family. We have to be realistic. When you have that powerful a family connected as they were for literally generations with law enforcement, they're going to get some deference. Now, whether or not the counsel for the, the, on the new civil suit can connect those dots to say it wasn't just niceness and deference, but it was a conspiracy to try and cooperate with the Murdaws against somebody else like Connor or someone. That's sort of what's going to be seen. But I will tell you, uh, knowing the lawyers who are now handling the civil case, as I do, they're going to dig their teeth in and they're going to use every source that they can to find out the information. And the trail seems to lead to that law enforcement did not do what they should have done to bring Murdoch to justice when they could have. Mark, I want to talk about that right after our commercial break. But before we do, you mentioned something about this powerful family. And Andrew, I want to ask you the final question in this particular section of our interview. Talk to us about what people are saying. I mean, I've read reports that the Murdoch family was as connected as could be to elected officials and law enforcement for nearly a century. Yeah, there's no one in a five county area that would be connected to Paul Murdoch's case in any form right now. You had various people in the solicitor's office currently who were connected to Alec Murdoch, who were connected to Randolph Murdoch, who were connected to law enforcement, the sheriffs in Beaufort County, Hampton County, and Jasper County all excused themselves from this case because they had too much connection to the situation. Just to add to those questions about what exactly was going on to Stephen Domino, who worked for the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office, who was the only sheriff's officer on that scene, was later fired in a short period of time after that situation, even though he was on that scene for alleged drug use and also making false statements. There's a lot of questions here in the entire county of Hampton and Colleton when it comes to this murder and this case was absolutely dead silent because of the power that the Murdochs had from the ability to do anything to them anywhere. And that was the fear that really had been placed into anybody feeling that they really had more power than anyone in a four to five county long area. And that belonged to everybody, no matter what your financial status would be. It's just amazing. And again, something that sounds like it came straight out of Hollywood. We are going to continue to talk with all of you about your expertise in this situation. I mean, it is complicated. But again, we're looking at essentially two crime scenes, one on the boat, the other on the Murdaugh's property, and still no word as to who would be responsible for the murder of Paul Murdaugh and his mother. Uh, coming up, we'll have much more on this story. Thank you to all of you for being a part of this conversation. Now, when we come back, we will discuss this and more on the motive. Welcome back. We're listening to chilling audio from a 2019 boat crash that killed a young South Carolina woman, only 19 years old, and allegedly was caused by a young, rich, and connected South Carolina man, Paul Murdaugh, who was later shot to death along with his mother in June of this year. My guests tonight are trial attorney Mark O'Mara, Savannah TV reporter Andrew Davis, and Judge Patricia Domingo, a former New York trial judge and now a judge on TV's Hot Bench. We want to at least include that part. Uh, right now, let's listen to another piece of that newly released recording. This is when police are actually asking uh, a young man who was on the boat with Paul Murdaugh, Anthony Cook, about who was driving the boat. Hey, I'm with the Department of Natural Resources. Who was driving the, the boat? Right, I'll pick up. The last time I grabbed my girlfriend and got down in the bottom of the boat, Paul was driving. Paul was driving? I begged and begged and begged and begged to let me drive. Uh-huh. And where were y'all coming from? Paul. Huh? Paul Key. Paul Key? Okay. And, and, and Paul was driving, not Connor? If Connor was driving, it happened. I'd done flipped out and laid down. With the fire department, as well as the DNR. 
They were, they were both sitting on the were, front seat. You were, you were laying, you were yeah, laying in the front. In the bottom, no, the back of the hit. bottom of the boat. Before you hit? Yes. Okay, and Paul and Connor were sitting on right and behind the, the console. Yeah. Yes. I can get a better okay, I'd done fought with both of them for 30 minutes about letting me drive, and both of them thought it was funny. Yeah. Okay. And again, that was Anthony Cook, one of the young men on the boat, uh, presumed to be operated by Paul Murdaugh, who was later murdered this summer. Now, Mark, I've got to go back to you. Again, we don't have a person of interest. We don't have a prime suspect in this case. But I would, I would think that pe people on the boat were among those who are going to be heavily interviewed as to the connection between the boat incident and the murder at the Murdoch property, correct? It just absolutely correct. It would just seem without any evidence yet to connect the two that they have to be connected, that there has to be some. It could be completely random that this execution style murder, double murder happened just random, but with no robbery attached to it, with nothing else, with all the planning that went into it to allow the escape, one would suggest that with everything else that's going on, most of which we don't know yet, but hopefully we'll find out through the civil suit. With most of that that we don't know, that there's got to be some connection, and certainly the Cook family is going to be a primary focus, the Beach family a primary focus, because those are the two people or families most impacted, of course, right. Mallory's death, and then the suggestion that Connor uh, was being blamed for driving when the evidence seems to support it was Murdoch. Right. Uh, we'll see, and hopefully the, the evidence coming from the civil suit and the depositions of these officers, this is one step in a long process of getting to the truth. But Judge Domingo, we can't decide, or rather we can't assume that in this case, in a case like this, that this is a revenge killing. Though, I mean, obviously that's one angle that investigators would look into. Of course it is. And, you know, the difficult part uh, for being on the bench is in stepping back from these, um, this finger pointing and saying, well, you know what, there is a connection between these two, so let's look at the Beach family, let's look at the Cook family, and kind of getting tunnel vision and avoiding looking at situations, other, other, other possibilities, relationships with other people. And, and I agree with, with, with Mark, and I agree uh, with your position before that, you know, it's not a random situation. I mean, the way this killing came down, the way the double murder came down, it wasn't as though somebody just went in there and decided to ransack the property and, and steal things. That's pretty clear that that's not what happened. And so when you don't have a robbery or you don't have some other crime attached to the actual homicide, I, you have to start to look at personal. And, and I think we often find that situations of assaults, violent crimes, generally there is a connection to someone uh, and it is personal on some level. Uh, and so here, with this trial that took so long, with the allegations and the suspicions that all of the uh, police were involved in covering up right. and in not wanting uh, to look beyond, uh, you know, trying to steer the investigation, make the situation murky uh, so that the Murdoch family was not uh, involved you really, uh, it's very difficult and it's very hard to step back from this as in, in my position and say, let's keep an open mind and let's just keep looking and get as much information as you possibly can mm -hmm. uh, to sort through to say, we've done all we can. We've looked at blood tests. We've looked at uh, witness statements. Yeah, we've looked at the police. We've, we've checked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know that they didn't ask for um, a breathal, uh, a test on the scene for Paul Murdaugh they did with Connor but at the hospital thank goodness the doctors felt that perhaps he had hit his head and there was some the way he was acting, he was acting and so they did a blood test and that's right. how they found out that he had more than three times the um, legal limit of alcohol so sometimes things unfold in a very strange way but you need to really look at these facts objectively Andrew I have to ask you I mean the locals in South Carolina all of whom know who this family is. Are they still talking about this? No one is talking about Adrian. That's the interesting thing about this because of the power the family has. When you look at this too, that's where some of those questions come in about Alec Murdoch, his father, Paul's father in this case, where there's a lot of testimony about how when he went to the hospital, 
suddenly he was trying to get into people's rooms from some of these kids who were injured, that there perhaps was a thought that the stories were changing, that they were suddenly getting a, a form of amnesia, if it was, as Alec and his father, Randolph, who has since passed away himself, were also involved in this and suddenly telling them perhaps what to say or telling them they'd take care of them, or that's where the question's about whether Connor Cook was driving, whether Paul was driving, and it became a murky situation. There were a lot of questions about whether Alec himself was trying to steer some of this conversation away from his own son. Does that make him a suspect in the next murder? No, of course not. It means he's pre protecting his son, but it does bring in a lot of questions about exactly how far he might go or what he might do in a case like this and in future cases when it comes to protecting his own family. Yeah, you know, it was very emotional to hear Alex Murdaugh on the 911 calls, which we've heard, and crying, emotional, overcome with emotion at the sight of finding his son and his wife murdered. So this case, obviously, a long way from being finished. We thank you, Marco Mara, Andrew Davis, and Judge Domingo. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Still to come, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is fighting for his political life. He was a media darling last year, but some say that certain members of the media were not digging deep enough with one of the most unkept secrets of New York political circles. We'll discuss next. Governor Cuomo has projected an air of much needed competence during the epidemic, and the people are there for it. It's starting to feel like America has this one president in Washington, but a whole different president for the coronavirus crisis, who's the guy in charge in New York. And everything that he ever said mattered to him about public service is what you demonstrated right here. You came across so honest, like, no, I'm telling you everything there is to know. Boom, boom, boom. And I was like, Oh, he's doing it so perfect. I love this. There's a group of women who came out and they said, we, we're we falling in love with Cuomo. And I said, well, yeah, everyone, everyone should wear Cuomo sexual in that way. Wow, how times have changed. That was just a sampling of the fawning media coverage New York Governor Andrew Cuomo received during his initial, initial rather, response to the pandemic. Of course, then things changed with the uh, concern over senior citizen deaths at convalescent homes. But this week, public officials, friends, and some members of the media world have been backtracking big time, with the majority of commentators now demanding his resignation. The flip-flop comes after the damning report from New York Attorney General Letitia James, which concluded that Cuomo sexually harassed at least 11 women. Last year, Cuomo's political star was definitely on the rise with the hashtag President Cuomo trending on social media, articles calling him the king of New York. Now, according to surveys, a majority of New York lawmakers and residents say he needs to go. We're joined tonight by two people who understand this story better than anyone, a former advisor to George W. Bush and John McCain and co-host of Showtime's The Circus, Mark McKinnon and the chief investigative correspondent for Yahoo News and host of the Conspiracy Land series. Can I say that? Conspiracy Land uh, podcast series, The Secret Loves and Brutal Death of Jamal Khashoggi, Michael Isakoff. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Michael, I've got to start with you. We all remember how Governor Cuomo was heralded in those early days. Uh, what are we seeing now? Is, is what we are seeing now a result of people who've simply changed their mind or were they keeping their mouth shut? Neither. F facts changed. New allegations came out. Women came forward publicly. And you had this devastating report by the New York Attorney General, Tish James. So it's not a matter of people changing their minds. It's a matter of people hearing facts and findings that were not available before. Certainly, there's a long history of Andrew Cuomo, uh, his authoritarian tendencies, his bullying tendencies, all that was in the public sphere, all of which had been criticized by many over the years. But um, nobody uh, knew the extent of his certainly his personal misconduct mm -hmm. in terms of har harassing multiple women. And that was made clear this week. And it's not a majority of New York lawmakers who are now calling for him to resign. It's 
all of them. He's got no support in the state legislature right now. He has no support in the New York State congressional delegation. And the president of the United States, a member of his own party, has called on him to resign. I have to follow up with a question, though. And I think a lot of people at home would think this. You know that saying, like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? The fact that he's been a career politician for so long and that these behaviors are, again, even by his own admission, part of his culture, part of the generation that he comes from, that he's affectionate, he embraces, he kisses people in the face. And those are just some of the things that he was accused of in this investigative report. But wouldn't somebody have seen some of these behaviors before? Yes, and some did. But, uh, you know, I interviewed um, the other day on my Skullduggery podcast, Karen Hinton, who had been Andrew Cuomo's press secretary more than 20 years ago when he was a member of Bill Clinton's cabinet as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And she had experienced um, some of uh, uh, Cuomo's uh, conduct as she talks about how at one point he embraced her and got aroused in in a far more in a troubling way, a way that made her feel quite uncomfortable. But she said she was quite frank. She said she was not going to come forward because she did not want to jeopardize her career in um, in democratic politics. She was uh, uh, working for Cuomo at the time, and she knew that if she um, uh, if she spoke out, it uh, you know she'd be finished, uh, and so she did not speak out at the time. But she did now. Once other women came forward, she did speak to the uh, New York Attorney General's investigators. So I think this is often a process in which we learn more as more people come forward and more people speak out. It's just remarkable that it's taken this long, if this has been a longstanding character trait. Mark, I've got to ask you, some are criticizing members of the media giving Cuomo a quote unquote pass because he's a Democrat. You've advised Democrats and Republicans over the years. Did you notice any major difference with how they're covered if there was less accountability given to somebody based on their party? Well, I'd say yes, but I'd say that that was particularly true during the, the COVID coverage. I mean, there was just, as we saw there, kind of a love affair across all media. And people wanted to fall in love with the Cuomos. I mean, they saw the, they know the family history, kind of the dynastic nature of it. And they saw him as perhaps a, a future national candidate. So no question about it. And that, that's what makes this rise and fall so dramatic. Uh, and as Michael said, the facts have changed and so have the times. And neither are squared. And, you know, I think, but the other thing that's changed in our, in our culture and media is that you think might give him an opportunity is that, that, and, you know, exhibit A is Donald Trump, but people like Ralph Northam in uh, Virginia, there are Pauls these days who kind of say, I'm just going to push through this. I'm not going to react to the mob mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm, I'm just going to press through it. The problem, as Michael kind of alluded to here, is he literally has zero allies. And when I say zero allies, what is, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem in the New York State Legislature because he's likely to be impeached. And I suspect the way this thing plays out is that Cuomo, just given his nature, will fight till the very, very end. But the end will be impeachment. And at that time, I, su I, I submit that he will probably resign before he's impeached. So is you really do predict that he'll be, you'll, you think he'll step down, even though he said resignation is not an option? You know, that asterisk of impeachment, there's only one other New York governor in history, and I don't think he wants to be the second. Uh, Michael, we've seen a few impeachment processes over the years, only a few. It's very rare. Uh, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, obviously top the list. Uh, they can take a long time. The governor has up until August 13th to turn over his last bit of evidence before they do consider impeachment, which it sounds like they're all, you know, a harmony of, of yeses. Is there a chance, we've heard from Mark, is there a chance you think he could survive and pull out and possibly rebound? Well, I, it seems like he thinks there is, but he may be the only person at this point who thinks uh, that's the case. Look, I think, um, you know, the only thing he's got left is to try and drag this thing out and hope that the uh, 
uh, you know, public uh, interest fades in his troubles and moves on to other matters, and he can somehow survive. But I think, um, uh, you know, Mark is right. If it comes down to he's going to be impeached, and I think that's looking very likely at this point. Um, if he's impeached, then the, he, he, first of all, is immediately has to step down as governor. He doesn't get to stay on as governor while the trial takes place to wait for the verdict in the state Senate. He has to, under New York, the New York Constitution, uh, step down uh, at least for the rest of that process. So that would be the end of his days as governor. And then on top of that, to have to face a trial in the Senate where these women would presumably be called to testify and lay out what happened, all of those damning details in that report, it's hard to imagine that he would want that to unfold. Um, so I, I think it, it probably at the end of the day, he'll have to resign. He'll have no choice. Okay, I want really quickly, Mark, if you can just sum up very fast, because I'm out of time, but I wanted to ask you, you've counseled presidents, you've counseled celebrities. What would you tell Mr. Cuomo to do right now to, to somehow conserve any ounce of legacy? I'd say, uh, Governor, the end is inevitable. Go out on your own terms. Uh, you know, make make a fairly sort of rolled out uh, presentation of, to say, listen, you know, I, I don't believe I did anything wrong, but clearly, the you know, the investigators do. And I'm sad for that. I think I've had a great legacy. I've done X, Y, and Z. I'm going to step out of the way. So, uh, you know, I'm not a train wreck for New York and for the future of this state. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh allowing me to serve. Uh, good night. All right. Well, we say good night to the two of you, but see you soon. All right. Thank you, Mark McKinnon and Michael Isikoff. Michael's Conspiracy Land podcast series, The Secret Loves and Brutal Death of Jamal Khashoggi is now available. And speaking of true crime, you may know Allison Sweeney from Days of Our Lives or as host of The Biggest Loser, but she's taken her passion for crime and investigation and turned it into a mystery of her own making. She joins us next. Longevity in this business, well, really in any business, is priceless. And Allison Sweeney has it in spades, working since the tender age of four. That includes a two-decade run on Days of Our Lives, host of The Biggest Loser, and in her current role as the star and producer in a hugely successful series of Hallmark movies. The latest installment being Sweet Revenge, a Hannah Swenson mystery. Hello, Allison Sweeney. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Okay, I have to ask you, how was it reuniting with Cameron Matheson? Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> okay, I absolutely adore Cameron, and of course, who wouldn't? Um, but he is the nicest guy, so dreamy, so fun to work with, and it was really fun. It had been a couple of years. It was like, I don't know, like a high school reunion. You know, you feel like you just go back to the way things were when you were kids. Well, I think that you and he both have this, like, fountain of youth formula. You must drink every single day because <laughs> you both look as sweet and um, as, as just, I don't know, you're like American, oh. I, I don't know, you're just icons to a lot of us who watched you growing up. Oh, that is the nicest thing to say. Thank you so much. I was looking at those pictures, like, cringing a little bit, so no. thank you. No, no, no. Okay, but seriously, for you, can you name anybody else who successfully played a single character on TV for over 20 years of this generation? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I, uh, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there are lots that I am fans of from my childhood too. So I know exactly how you feel. There are people I, I look up to and admire and it's just so crazy because you sort of are just taking it one day at a time and you don't really think about it happening. I mean, that uh, actor, uh, Brian, you have him on the screen now. Yes. Um, he and I would joke about it. Like, I hope we play grandparents on the show one day at Days of Our Lives. And now here we are playing grandparents on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> it's like weird how, I, I don't know. It's just, you don't realize it's happening until 
it's already gone. Well, you, you manifested it. You spoke it into existence. Um, but, but guess what? Frasier Crane is another character who played uh, a popular character for 20 years. So we're going to give it to Kelsey Grammer as well. Give it to Kelsey Grammer. Yeah. He deserves it. Yeah. Cheers at Frasier. OK, so we're talking a lot about Sammy Brady because, I mean, hello. You're, you're this, this piece of history, in a sense, even though you're still very young. Uh, you, you really dropped out of UCLA for this role? Well, so I had been working at Days of Our Lives when I was in high school, and my dad was very serious about my academics. So I was taking the SATs. I was going to go to college. I applied, and uh, when I was, I I went to um, UCLA. I applied to USC, and then at Northwestern, the dean of admissions pulled my dad aside and said, "Please don't make her quit her job to go to college. Like this is what we go to college for." And so then it was I, worth it. So. <laughs> Yeah, so then I went to UCLA uh, night school for a little while, and it was just, I mean, it was a full-time job at Days, and I, I wasn't able to keep up both at the same time, and, uh, you know, I, I ended up just committing to the career, and it, wor it worked out so far. It, I think it worked out very, very well, but it had to be emotional. You know, I mean, just first of all, what was really emotional, I would think, is coming back to production, thank goodness for Peacock TV, and after the pandemic, you know, just being able to reunite with people. Oh my gosh, that was a big deal. And and honestly, it's it's really one of those things where you realize we're all a family, we're all in it together. Everyone's doing their part to um, help follow the rules. No matter what your thoughts are, we want to work and right. we want to make sure that everyone else has a chance to work. And so it was really sort of beautiful to see everyone pulling together and doing what they could, everyone's small part, and uh, making these movies for, for Hallmark is the same as a producer. You know, I have such compassion for everyone's feelings, and yet, you know, you have to say, we're, we're all a team, and we right. need to support each other so that we can keep going so we can keep making movies and keep working. Yeah, I, and I think I've, I've always had, you know, compassion for people who have high pressure jobs because I've been in one myself, but it's like thinking about the fact that you stayed with this character for 20 years. I mean, I would think number one, all of us had our emotions kind of raw during the past year and a half. Yeah. And, and, and we have to give each other a little more grace because the pressure was so on, but you've seen ups and downs through the years. How did you prevent yourself from becoming jaded or kind of, you know, becoming numb because you've seen and you've been through people leaving, new people coming, oh, yeah. changes. Changes, all sorts of changes. And I guess for me, first of all, I have to just, again, shout out to my family. I'm so grateful. I have amazing parents. I have great brothers. I now am, um, have a wonderful husband. We've been married for, what is it, 21 years now. Don't tell him I needed to do the math. <laughs> um, and, and so, and my kids, you know, like if you surround yourself with people who you love and who love you and who are, keep you grounded in that way, you kind of don't let it, like you said, the high pressure of it or the drama of it sweep you up. You know, I've always been able to come home to someone who kind of reminded me like, that that is just work. It, it's going to be OK. Let's go go swimming. Let's go for a run. Let's go do something else that takes your mind off of that. It's not the only thing in the world. Well, and your husband happens to be a CHP officer, California Highway Patrol. So Talk about high stress. Yeah, exactly. He has some empathy there. Uh, when we come back, I really want to talk to you about that and about your relationship because it sounds very dreamy itself. So stick around, yeah. Alice and Sweeney. And for those of you at home, stay tuned. We're going to talk about those Hallmark movies, too. The day before Ronnie's murder, she and Jacqueline Grant got in a big dust up at the bakery. Oh yeah, about what? Well, I don't know for sure, but I would think it had something to do with the fact that her husband was buying Ronnie gifts. Do you do this often? Involve yourself in his criminal investigations? I, I wouldn't say often. No. And just what is your area of expertise? I'm a baker. You just saw a clip from Sweet Revenge, a Hannah Swinson mystery, premiering August 8th at 9 p.m. on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. And that was Allison Sweeney and Cameron Matheson starring there. Okay, I have to say, this is a little bit of life and art imitating life, right? Because you are married to a law enforcement officer. So did it inspire the role? 
Yeah, well, it's Dave's favorite uh, co-star of mine because he of his law enforcement background. But um, it's definitely fun, you know, and Dave always gives me good lines of dialogue to include in the movies for some realism. And um, we had actually a hilarious story with Cameron. Couldn't figure out how to put on the, the shoulder holster correctly. And it was midnight and I had to call Dave and FaceTime with him to get him to explain to us how to make it work. Oh my gosh, it was hilarious. And Dave, we want to remind our viewers, Dave is your husband, your husband is a CHP officer. Oh yes, Dave officer. is my real life husband. Your real life husband. And you've known each other, like, was he your babysitter? Did I read that correctly somewhere? Okay. Wow, yes, you know everything about me. Okay, so um, <laughs> my, our parents are friends and actually his dad and my mom were violinists for the feature film industry. They made wow. soundtracks for all the movies since we were kids. So we actually have known each other our whole lives. But yes, it is true. I chased him around the swimming pool when I was little and he would babysit me Aww. when our parents were having dinner together. Okay, that is the sweetest thing I've heard today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. And, and yeah, you I had such a crush on him. And, and you, I, it looks like you still do. So happy anniversary to you whenever your anniversary is. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I do have to ask you a personal question. I want to ask this with all due respect. Obviously, you know, with your husband being a law enforcement officer and the times that we're in, it has been so much more intense. It has been controversial. It has been polarizing. How difficult is that for you being the wife of a law enforcement officer? It's really difficult. And um, I just can say that my husband is someone I am so proud of every single day. I'm proud of the work that he does. I'm proud of that it is something he's wanted to do to um, give back to the community since he was a little kid. And, uh, you know, I, I have so much respect for him. And does it sometimes get difficult? Do people sometimes challenge you? I mean, being a public figure to answer difficult questions about some of these things that are very politicized and, and also very real. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, look, like everything political, it's always so difficult these days, right? I mean, there's so many difficult topics to address. But for me, actually, the, the stories that stand out to me are the people who make such an effort to let me know that what my husband does means something to them, and they appreciate it, and they say thank you. And I can't... <laughs> I can't tell you how much um, it means to me when people make an effort like that, actually. It's really special. And right now, it's inspiring these uh, roles that you're in as you have this sweet revenge mystery. Uh, it looks we like, like to give people a fun time, you know, a break from everything that's going on in the world. Just like, in, you know, a little candy, TV candy. You're the perfect person to give it to us because you really are so sweet. And I mean, I'm just saying that from having this conversation with you. Um, but your character is planning a wedding, it looks like, for herself, um, but plans to well, kind of... Well, she's nervous about it, okay. yes. And then it's really <laughs> cute because her mother is actually the bridezilla in the story. And it's so fun and funny. And I imagine so many women out there just have that kind of whatever, tr trouble with their family or their mother or what, you know, mom wanting one thing and the kid wants a different, you know, and having to negotiate that. I, I love that about Hannah that she, she's um, always trying to be the, the common, you know, ground. She's trying to make everyone happy and, and, uh, it doesn't always work out for her. <laughs> As in real life, when a woman tries to make everybody happy, it's like at one point, you got to know what you want and you got to go for it, right? And it looks like you've done that throughout your career. So we want to say thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was really lovely talking to you. Lovely talking to you too. Continued success. We'll see you, I'm sure, very, very soon. In fact, we're going to see you so soon. It's this weekend. Everybody yep. in the audience, you got to check out Allison Sweeney and Sweet Revenge, a Hannah Swinson mystery premiering August 8th at 9 p.m. on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Good night. Have a great night and have a good night to those of you at home. That's it for us this evening. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night for Banfield. Ashley will be back next week, but I'll be here tomorrow.